Hey, everyone. Welcome back. If you have been around the Lizard Lounge, then you no doubt have heard of Arcade to Earn. And some of us were even lucky enough to be included in the recent XARC token airdrop. Though, while a name can be familiar, that doesn't always mean that we're familiar with the company or the product that they're pushing out. So, to help clear the air, today I have none other than JP, the co-founder and CEO of Arcade to Earn, to tell us all about the site their TGE event, which is coming up here shortly, and what you will need to know to go ahead and get started. And, you know, before we go any further, we have to do kind of that standard, this is not financial advice, always do your own research. And you know what, to help you with that research, we have the white paper, we have the TGE information, and a couple other of my content creator videos linked in the description below. So make sure to follow up on all of that to make sure you know what's going on. And today, I like to start it stupid simple. So JP, if you don't mind, can you just like give us a broad overview of what even is Arcade to Earn? Sure. Um, thanks again for having me. Always a pleasure uh, to talk to you. And um, yeah, so for, for those that kind of haven't heard our spiel before, um, Arcade to Earn is essentially a GameFi exposure platform. Um, I like to think of it like a in real life arcade in the sense of you would take like your, you know, $5 bill or whatever, you would go into an in real life arcade, you'd put your dollar bill into a machine, you'd get some tokens back, and you would use those tokens to go and interact with a bunch of different games. Um, the difference with our platform and, and what blockchain gaming has enabled us to be able to do is for you to be able to get kind of financial exposure to these games instead of just the entertainment exposure because there's the financial layer on top of GameFi. So mm -hmm. we we built a platform that allows for people to get that exposure without a lot of the common barriers to entry that, that people see. Um, there's like three main ones that we're solving for. Uh, the first would be um, lack of you know money to go and buy every NFT that you want to be able to buy to play in the games. Yeah. Um, lack of gaming interest. Like there's people that want to just be investors in GameFi and like we want to build tools for those people that are kind of separate from the tools that we build for gamers and then the third being um you know just a lack of time uh at the rate at which the industry is growing um a content creator like you I'm sure can uh can uh, empathize with the uh, how difficult it is to keep up with all of the different games that are launching like what does this NFT do what does that one do what do I earn with this what do I get with that and um, so our platform kind of consolidates all of that down into one place where you can get diversified exposure to the industry. Um, so maybe I'll stop there. I'm sure we'll get into more details, uh, but that I could ramble forever. So feel free <laughs> to cut me off at any point. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I mean, honestly, the three things that you mentioned, I find super intriguing I, as a content creator and like content creating is kind of like my fun job, like my fun gig, mm -hmm. my fun hobby. Um, I only have so many hours in a day, which is why yep. Mostly, I like I mainly cover Alluvium and covering a little bit of ETH Lizards gives me that opportunity to like still participate in other ecosystems, which is why I like ETH Lizards. You know, it's mm -hmm. it's that general knowledge all coming in. And I, I love what you guys are doing because, yeah, you're right. You can't afford. I mean, think of Axie back at the height of its day when having a solid team cost you a minimum of like $800 mm -hmm. just to play the game. And, you know, all the different games on different chains that you have to kind of like, well, okay, I have to set up, you know, for base or for AVAX or for Solana, all of those different, it's, it's, it can be a headache to keep yeah. track of where all your assets are as well. So I'm, I'm really curious then it's like, would you say like, who is the odd main audience? Would you say it's for investors who are kind of the big rollers and can, you know, pull out five to 25 K or can anyone add like a smaller price? So say I have 20 bucks, could I participate? Yeah. So I think one of the unique value propositions of our platform is that part of the goal was to, uh, so I, I think what you're describing very rightly is, um, or very accurately is that the whales, the people with lots of money usually have access to unique opportunities. They can do things that other smaller fish maybe can't do. Um, what we're building is we're trying to, to level that playing field so mm -hmm. that the smaller investors or players can get the same exposure as the larger people. So, you know, maybe for an example, you as a smaller time investor can't afford a tier four alluvium land, right? Like it's just out of your budget. It's just like, you know, 
it is what it is type of thing. I can afford a tier one, but if I want the same experience or the same exposure to someone that has a tier four land, the way you get that is by kind of fractionalizing the, the exposure to those higher end assets. And so that's what the arcade mission pool platform does is we could have a mission pool for, for tier four alluvium land management and someone with $5 and someone with $5,000 is getting the same exposure to that NFT asset. So at this time, like, are there minimums and maximums um, in terms of being involved? So no, there's there's not any minimum or maximum. I, I guess there would kind of, well, okay, let me rephrase. There is no minimum. There is a maximum to, so we have like an anti-whale measure uh, put into okay. place with these, with these mission pools to where any one single wallet can't deposit more than like i think it's the default is like 20 percent of a mission pool so we do have some anti-whale measures because what we didn't want is for all of our like venture capital friends to come in and just like max fill every pool and then people aren't being able to get anything right so um and yes you could get around it by like splitting up a bunch of different wallets and stuff but that's just crypto like you can always you can always pretty much find a way around things um so we're it's something we're we're cognizant of and we're taking measures to deter people from doing um for minimum there really isn't a minimum um actually the reason that we decided to build out on an avalanche c chain um instead of like ethereum mainnet is we wanted to keep the fees you know low so that people mm -hmm. even with five dollars can go and feel like they're they're doing something right if you only have five dollars and you're on eth mainnet it takes you twenty dollars to deposit into a mission pool it's like why even bother so Seriously. um so yeah, no minimums for the pools, but there is an anti-whale uh, kind of deterrent factor. Now, in terms of like investing into these missions, right? So it's not like, great example is the tier four land. Someone owns a tier mm -hmm. four land. They open up for kind of the mission. Can you explain to us kind of from creation to completion what a mission is that you're investing in? Yeah, so a mission is a, uh, a good way to look at or a good way to think about it is well, what it literally is, is a derivative of any type of in-game activity. So um, a mission on the platform would be uh, a fixed amount of time for a certain activity uh, using, you know, sticking to the alluvium example. It could be 30 days of harvesting fuel from a tier four alluvium land like that could be a mission. And what the uh, what is actually happening on the back end is arcade arcade either already owns that tier four land we have our own treasury of assets and we reinvest you know our own revenue and our own stuff into buying additional assets for the platform um so either we own the asset or a network of hedge funds venture capital whales mm -hmm. that we work with own the asset uh, we have one investment dow um that uh worked with us to give to to allocate like 200 plots of land from the alpha season right so like that's a good example mm -hmm. of an external investment DAO that says i don't want to manage the land work with arcade because of our network um and um that's how the the plots are, are sourced so it's important to note that with a mission pool it's not crowdfunding right the tokens you put into a mission aren't being used to like buy the land the land is already owned by us or a partner mm -hmm. um but from there the actual in-game activity takes place we work with gamers and that's that's kind of where um so we are you know kind of a platform built for speculators on the contributor side where people are putting their tokens into the pools but we're also a platform built for gamers because if you're someone that just really loves alluvium and you you want to to manage a tier four plot of land for 30 days you could work with arcade to operate that land without having to put up the capital to buy a tier four land right so we're kind of mm -hmm. this we're separating what is a gamer and what is a you know quote unquote investor and kind of giving them uh, both their piece of the puzzle but in this uh in this example the mission would take place the the gamer would play the land for 30 days mm -hmm. um there's a there's a reward from that activity that reward goes back to the mission pool and is then split amongst the different parties. So the contributors, mm -hmm. what we call the mission pool contributors or the arcade token holders, they would get their piece for being a part of that mission. The operator gets their cut for the labor. Um, and then that's kind of how everything divvies up. So a lot of interesting things there and a lot of new questions popping up for me. <laughs> um, 
the first one of which, so you'd mentioned that like arcades say arcade owns the T4 land. What percentage of these assets are owned by arcade and what percentage owned by um, other VC groups? Yeah, I would say currently um, it's around a 80% owned by Arcade, 20% from partners. Um, now, part of our model for scalability is to lean more heavily into partner assets because it's just at the rate that we're going to onboard new users and new interest and have a need for more mission pools, mm -hmm. that is going to happen faster than we can reinvest company revenue into assets. So part of what makes us scalable is that network of partners. But we uh, initially, it's going to be very heavily weighted for us. Um, and for assets that Arcade owns, there's obviously a bigger split for mission pool contributors and operators because we don't have to take a big cut as the owner because the platform is is already getting a small transaction fee the the only time that the the amount could drop is if there's a, a an external party that owns that asset because they obviously have to get another piece of the pie right the owner mm -hmm. would get 15 percent off the top and then it gets split um so yeah um it's a little bit of both and it'll continue to be both but i would say uh, starting out, it's it's heavily weighted for arcade owners. So how do you determine then who you allow in as a partner to be able to put their NFTs forward and be that part of the site? Yeah, so um, it's so it's a manual process. We have to do kind of some manual review on our part. It so far, it's really just been referrals from our network. Um, you know, one of our backers will come and say like, "Hey, we've got a friend that has a hundred plots of land or whatever. Like, can you talk to him and see if it's a good fit?" And then we negotiate the arrangement, the splits, the all of that stuff on our hand, our blah, on our end uh, with the partner. But so I would say it's it's a very kind of um, it's not a, a very formally outlined process at the moment. It's more just like talk to this person on Telegram and see if there's yeah. a fit here. Um, we'll probably have a more formal process for it uh, once we're up and running. Um, once we're like, you know, running public mission pools in the next month or two, we'll probably have a more formal process. And then in terms of the person who's actually playing the land and doing the actions, how do you determine who plays it? Um, so that's also kind of a manual process at the moment. So there's kind of two paths that we're taking. Um, the first is um, Arcade has um, has uh, sole ownership of a gaming guild that's very specifically targeted to nurturing gamers that mm -hmm. we can KYC to play on, on plots of land and stuff. So we have that option. Um, and then additionally, we have a network of... Um, we have a network of game guilds and professional gamers that we work with. So um, YGG, Merit Circle, Good Games Guild, uh, Guildfy, um, even more niche game, uh, guilds like Wildfire, like Wildfire uh, ran some of the Alluvium land that we got from that third party. So that's a good example of like when third parties can be sourced and then a guild can be used as the operator. Um, so it's a manual process for review. At the moment, it's mostly going to organizations like Wildfire, and then Wildfire would determine who the players actually are on their side. But um, but we will have a process in which like just some person that is a gamer and really thinks that they're good at a certain game can come to us and put an application in to be a mission pool operator. And what that enables them to do is to play a game that they enjoy with assets that they may not otherwise be able to afford or or. Um, maybe they don't have an interest in, in buying, right? They want to play the game, but they don't mm -hmm. like the finance side. They don't want the the uh, capital risk associated with owning the NFT. Yeah, that makes it really interesting, especially for things like, again, we're, I know Alluvium, so we're going to stick with yeah. Alluvium examples. But, you know, say there is an esports player who just can't afford a top tier PvP team with like the big ones, you know, Rampire mm -hmm. or Fisto, because maybe those end up costing a lot. You know, it sounds like they could... Yeah put a mission pool together that says, hey, I'm going to participate in this tournament. You guys can lend them the NFTs they need. People can, you know, contribute to the pool. And I mean, that's pretty cut and dry. You know, they either place high enough to get some money back or they don't. So, yep. I mean, obviously, if, if if it fails, there's nothing to give back. Um, I think you had mentioned in a pre... One, one of the things I love best about this, sorry. <laughs> I'm kind of getting sidetracked. Is it's correct, and correct me if I'm wrong, 
if I put, say, 200 um, ARC tokens into a mission, and even if the mission fails, I still get that 200 back, yes? Exactly. So, yeah, what you're contributing, you can think mm -hmm. of it kind of just like a... Uh, it, it, what it's literally happening is it's being held in escrow in a smart contract. It's just like a token sink. It's taking it out of circulation. But those tokens aren't being sent anywhere. They're not being spent. They're never at risk of loss from like a wager or anything. Um, so in the example of, and part of what gamifies our platform is that there is a, uh, there is not a guaranteed success, right? There, mm -hmm. you have to kind of play the platform by deciding which activities have the highest, you know, success rate, which of them is going to have a mission pool operator that's like more reliable or, or does their, their job better. And if the mission is, is a success, you leave with more than you came in with. If the mission is a failure, you leave with what you came in with. And um, you would just take your 200 tokens and go find another mission. So let's, I mean, so you got the, this succeeds, you have the, this is failing. Um, mm -hmm. So in the case, let's say, tier four, tier four land, let's say the goal, the mission is to get 100 Solon from that land in you know 30 days mm -hmm. what happens if they only harvest half of that is that considered a failure and just nothing gets distributed is it a partial win yeah so um as far as like the stages go um it would be considered a win so it would be considered success um we don't have tags for like partial failure or like partial success if you if you earn anything back then it's a success but um in that example, just half of the expected reward would be what would get distributed. And we have a, I don't know if you would say it's a formula or an equation. The, the devs did their dev thing to where when you see a, uh, when a new mission pops up and you see expected reward, a thousand arcade tokens, it would take, what is actually calculating that number is it takes all of the historical data from all similar missions. So all of the previous Alluvium land missions that were maybe harvesting for Solon, it would calculate, okay, here's the reward from each of those previous ones. And then it calculates, this is what's expected. So if one of those missions comes back half as fruitful as is expected, it just brings the average down for future mm, okay. uh, missions of that type. So it calculates it into the historical data, but um, it would still be a success. Now, um, you know, kind of again, back to what gamifies the platform is if we have two like missions where maybe there's one that's operated by wildfire and one that's operated by xyz guild and wildfire brings back 110 it was expected to get 100 the other one brings back 80 then you as a contributor an arcade token holder like someone that's actually trying to get the most out of the platform would see that and be like okay next time i'm gonna go with the wildfire one because they have a history of bringing in more rewards right so there is a little bit of strategy to how you pick and choose your your missions and then in terms of the expected rewards, like, is that like, this is the total expected rewards that they expect to come back and it will be split amongst everyone involved? Or is that the estimated rewards for each individual? I think at the moment, the way it is shown on the UI is the total. I think I've already told the UI UX team that to me, it would be more relevant to, sh to show like based on my amount, this is what's expected, like do the math ahead of time to divide it up. Oh, yeah. I don't think that's cu currently how it's working. Um, we're actually working with uh, Scoriox. He, so you probably know that he has a, a background in, in UX. We're actually mm -hmm. working with him to uh, help refine some of the UI UX on the platform. So for those of you that are fans of Scoriox, uh, hopefully the UI UX mm -hmm. will get improved um, with his help. And then when it comes to the percentage uh, split in terms of what goes to the NFT holder, the gamer, the people who have staked their ARC tokens, um, how is the per percentage split like determined? Is it just standardized or customizable per mission? It's very much customizable per mission. So uh, there will probably become a standard as we get more missions of, of like you know, kind uh, under our belt. But but what I was saying is um, it's very much customizable based on the amount of effort that it takes for a certain activity. So if it's, um, you know, a good example would be the tournament that you mentioned before. It mm -hmm. probably takes less skill, less effort to manage Alluvium land as it would take to win a tournament, right? So the tournament mission pool would probably have a bigger piece going to the competitor because it takes a little bit more skill, a little bit more expertise. Um, 
so it's it's very much customizable. I would say that it is it's so part of kind of the business side of the platform is that arcade, the platform is always going to negotiate in favor of the the mission pool contributors. Like we're gonna fight for the mission pool contributors to get the big the biggest cut, whereas the operator is going to be on the other side of the table fighting for the most that they can get as the operator, right? So there's going to always be a negotiation there. And part of the beauty of a free uh, competitive environment is that as we have more mission pool operators, if one of them says, I'll only do it for 60% and the other one, you know, and we just say, we won't do it for 60, we'll just go to the next person that'll do it for 40, right? If as long as they have, uh, so we're always going to kind of negotiate in favor of, of the operator or of the, um, the platform, which is good for arcade token holders. And then in terms of the NFTs themselves, like, how does the lending process work in terms of if you bring a gamer on, you know, you do have to physically give them the NFTs so they can have it in their wallets to play the games in, in some instance, in instances. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, in other games, there are some trustless systems set up. Uh, what? How are you guys handling that that situation to make it, I mean, as safe as possible yeah. for whoever owns it um, and vice versa? Yeah, so some games... Um, some games are building in-game solutions for this. Uh, mm -hmm. Big Time is a good example of one where, like, they have a pretty a pretty solid in-game rental system that we can build on top of. Um, even things like uh, for the alpha season of Alluvium Land, um, you know, you could just share like Web two details of like login credentials and stuff, and the asset itself is protected. So yeah. each game is a little bit different. Um, I think one. So there's kind of two at scale solutions uh the first of which is that we're partnered with some protocols uh iq protocol is one example um they're a uh, a product that's been created by parsic and they are they're building like um trustless lending for nft assets on chain so there's several partners of ours that are building solutions that are a little bit more of a blanket solution for those uh games where there's not an in-game solution um the uh, other thing i'll note that i think is not very widely known because i don't think we've really publicized it very much so you might be the first creator Ooh. that uh where this information is coming out but um we're building our own uh proprietary technology for uh that's very game specific for trustless lending so like we'll we'll have a game our devs are going in and basically building a custom solution for that game for trustless lending and then uh we'll have that for into infinity for for mission pools so we're building our own solution where there isn't one that already exists but um but in a lot of cases like big time there's already a pretty good system is that a system when you guys build it that will be kept on the platform for users of the platform or is that something you look to kind of expand and open up to other people yeah so initially it will be our own tech um but I do think there's probably a path forward where we'll commercialize it and um, and offer it to to other solutions. Um, at least initially, it'll probably be kind of our own proprietary software. But um, as long as the business side of it makes sense and and I can bring value back to to arcade and the token holders, then sure. I mean, there is it. definitely demand for it. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, and then kind of we're going to jump back to the people yeah. who be playing the NFTs. Um, you had mentioned in the white paper, you know, that they're going to be able to use Arcade's advanced knowledge base and analytics to really optimize their in-game strategy. I guess what kind of a library of information do you have built up for that? Yeah. So we have a, a pretty uh, robust uh, research team uh, at Arcade that their entire job is to go and research the games, the the game loops, the different strategies, and uh, they'll create reports on that information that we can share with the community. Um, I So I think we might actually already have some of it. I don't know if I can share my screen here, but I think I might have um, some examples I can show. But essentially, it'll be in the form of like research reports uh, that'll be on our website so if you just want to learn about um you know about a certain game and the strategy for that game you'll be able to go in and to our website and you'll have information from um provided by our, our mission pool operators provided by our research team um 
and you'll be able to kind of learn more about uh, the different opportunities in that game. Um, and that's something we're going to continue to build on. We'll have, um, so the mission pools themselves, the mission pool pages uh, will have like a live streaming uh, embed where you can see like the mission pool operator do, conducting the activities. You can learn that's about cool. like how they do a certain thing. Um, so there's a lot of ways that we're going to kind of enhance that connection between the player and the um uh and the contributor right so that they can look at it a little bit like a, a place they can go to learn about the game learn about different strategies um and yeah so we're, we're definitely going to lean into that that's really cool i mean especially if you get people who are like kind of have a bit of experience doing the streaming because it's it is not as easy yeah. as it seems to stream a game, explain what you're doing in a comprehensible way. I still struggle mm -hmm. with it myself. But yeah, if you can have that tied into the mission, I mean, you're really turning yeah. arcade to earn kind of as an arcade to learn, right? Yeah. If you've got your library of information, plus you've got these these streaming things that you can tap into when the person's live doing their thing, that, that's cool. Yeah. I'm yeah. stoked for that, not going to lie. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I guess kind of tying into that a little bit, um, you also mentioned, well, the white paper mentions that um, there's going to be different metrics uh, for token holders to analyze before, you know, they jump into a mission. And we, we've mm -hmm. talked about it a little bit in terms of seeing the expected rewards going up and down. Well, what other kind of metrics can um, people look at before they commit their ARC tokens into the pool? Yeah, yeah so on the player side, we're building into the profiles for mission pool operators. It's going to pull uh, historical data from or, or current data from um, other uh, gaming related sources. Uh, I don't know if I'm wording that correctly, but an example, you'll, you'll be able to connect your arcade MPO profile to Steam or to Epic Games, and it'll pull in data on how many trophies have you won like in in the history of your profile in steam or whatever and i think even the the api that that we're looking at shows like uh how many hours you have in a certain like genre of game so if you're trying to consider like uh admission pool operator for alluvium land management maybe you want to go with someone that has like a bazillion hours in like city skyline or whatever and like you know they have like a mind for for building things like that um you'll be able to do a little bit of research into those different metrics um in terms of the historical data for a specific mission uh, we talked about it a little bit in terms of the expected reward but you'll also have data around what percentage of the time has this mission pool operator had a success versus failure, right? Like, mm -hmm. do they have a 80% success rate? Is it a 100% success rate? And what I think you'll start to see once we have a more competitive field of mission pool operators is people will negotiate their cuts of these activities based on how prestigious their record is, right? If they have a 100% success rate, they might say, okay, I can justify five more percent and maybe mm -hmm. someone else. So you as a contributor would have to weigh the pros and cons of, do I go with a 100% success rate, but my reward is a little bit lower? Or do I go with an 80% success rate, but my reward's a little higher, right? So you can see where it really turns into strategy um, in mm -hmm. how you pick and choose your different missions. But we're gonna put as much data as we can into the, uh, the platform, but at, at least initially it'll probably be expected reward as a uh, equation of historic rewards for an activity and then also metrics around success and failure rate for for the MPO that's conducting the mission. And so like right now, there are missions on the site that people can start kind of getting their toes wet and involved in. And there's, mm -hmm. you know, there's kind of some basic information. How long, I guess, do you expect it to take before we start seeing kind of that more detailed data? Because obviously we kind of just have to build up the history yeah. up first. Yeah, so we're currently in a closed alpha state in the sense of the only way to get the Exarch token is for someone to send it to you, like, or to get it from like an airdrop through like Eve Lizards or whatever. Mm -hmm. So the number of users, we actually already have over 5,000 profiles created, which is not a, a crazy number, but I think it's a decent number considering we've only had this live for about two months and it's been mm -hmm. closed access. But as numbers build up and we get more data from like, not only the mission pool contributor side, but also we get more missions under our belt from the MPO side. Um, we'll be able to see more of that data come to light. Um, at the moment, I would say by the end of March, we will have 
more data ready because we're, we're running missions currently. But also some of these games just don't have even live economies yet to the point where like here's a mafia is a good example we're running one right now which because we're in an alpha like a closed action state we're able to supplement rewards using the arcade token but it once the platform is public and it's live we won't necessarily be just like creating practice missions like we are now we'll have you know everything will be based on whatever live economies are out there and that's part of why it took us so long to launch not because we weren't ready a year ago, but because the games weren't really live a year ago and it would have been difficult. So um, that's a rambly answer. I would say <laughs> end of March, we'll have more data. And then from there, it'll just get more robust. No, that's good. I was actually really curious about it because I've like been checking out the site. I've like, you know, I was lucky enough to get one of the Blizzard airdrop tokens. I'm like, oh, let's figure out how this works. I'm like, tier four land resources. That That's still in a... That's still in its uh, closed beta for for land holders. Yep. And it's like, you're not actually getting anything from that, but there's token rewards of that. That's great. You, we're uh... Yeah, so we're, we're pulling it from basically a pile of tokens that can, it's like a community release token pool where we can supplement those activities for now because, yeah, like you said, there won't be any actual earnings coming into those until the economy goes live. So for our testing purposes, we're just supplementing it. And then, so um, for people who want to get involved, uh, I think what your your TGE, your token generation event, was supposed to be on February twenty seventh, I think. But it, you what you told me it recently got pushed back. Yeah. yeah so we were going to do February twenty seventh. Um, we actually, so we were like earlier this month, we were going into like what would be considered like a KOL like. Um, circuit where we talked to like a bunch of creators about like their interest in what we're doing and some of them invested into us and they were there was so much like overwhelming interest i mean that's like weird to say but it literally was just there was so much overwhelming interest that we're still having a lot of those conversations and we were we just got to a point where we're like okay we can't line all of the content up from like all the people that want to work with us in the next two weeks like we need to push out um so it's not because the product's not ready um I mean, it's live right now. Anyone that has tokens can go and use it. Um, we just uh, we wanted to make sure that we aligned with some of these bigger names in the industry that that want to make content with us. So um, so, yeah, the new date is March 19th um, and it was February 27th. So um, March 19th is when uh, people will be able to get their hands on it. And for anyone interested uh, in again, correct me if I'm wrong, if it's changed, uh, but you will be able to participate in that TGE event on Ford Foundry is the site you guys are utilizing? Yep, Fjord Foundry. Um, so we're doing uh, two different uh, kind of mechanisms. We have um, some more traditional launch pads like Dowmaker. We're working with Dowmaker, if you're, I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with that. So there'll be a sale there as well. And then we'll have, which is a fixed rate, sale so it's like a, a fixed token price and then on march 19th is when we'll have uh what's called the liquidity bootstrapping uh you know event uh which is the fjord sale um we're not really looking at the fjord part as a sale because essentially what fjord does is it allows for price discovery and for us to seed additional liquidity for the uniswap decks okay. so uh, for people that are in the communities of the launch pads or have access to like the down makers and stuff, you'll be able to get in a little bit earlier. Uh, it'll probably be like the 17th or 18th. And then for the rest of the public, you'll be able to start buying uh, as of the 19th on Fjord or on the secondary market immediately after Fjord uh, with Uniswap. When it when it comes to Arcade Darn, there are actually two tokens involved in mm -hmm. kind of participating in that ecosystem. Can you talk about like that circle of interaction between, you know, getting the first putting it on the yeah. site and all that. Yeah. Um, so the primary token is ARC. It's ARC. Um, that token lives on Ethereum mainnet. And um, that is the liquidity bearing token in the sense of that's the token that we will be providing liquidity support on the DEX. That's the token that will be listed on exchanges. Um, and so that's like the primary liquidity bearing token. The token that you use in the arcade is XARC, which is uh, the token that interacts with our DAP. And going back to the in real life example, 
arc would be the five dollar bill x arc would be the gold tokens you get mm -hmm. out of the machine yeah. and so x arc you swap at a one to one ratio for x arc when you enter into the platform so you take your arc on eth mainnet we have a bridge that's powered by layer zero <clears throat> and that bridge will bridge you to avalanche and also swap from arc to x arc um, it's always at a one-to-one -one ratio the reason we do that is number one so that you can have the lower fees of the you know the benefits of avalanche c chain for fees and finality for uh number two it enables us to much more precisely tweak the platform economy so that we know how so basically instead of having to take into account all arc tokens in circulation we're able to just take into account what x arc is in circulation because those are the only tokens that could be deposited into a mission pool mm -hmm. right and by having the power to do that we can pick the limits because mission pools have have limits right there's a yeah. there's a max cap for the missions if you know we have a hundred thousand just you pull in examples out if we have a hundred thousand arc tokens but only ten thousand of them are x arc then we don't need a mission pool to have fifty thousand available right because there's only ten thousand that are in x arc so it allows us to more precisely um pick the kind of the the barriers for the different missions okay. so there's there's an economic benefit to it on that side but um and then also the benefit of, of it being on a more efficient chain and then since it's always kind of that one-to-one -one ratio what is the total mm -hmm. token supply then i mean obviously at times it can be split yeah. between arc and x arc but so the the equation is it's always total amount of circulating arc plus total amount of circulating x arc equals 800 million of a max so the um it is a fixed supply it's not inflationary um and because of the way the swap mechanic works when you swap you are literally on chain burning arc and minting x arc so there is no risk of like a you know a bunch of arc tokens sitting in a wallet getting exploited and now the the balance is off or whatever it's always the amount of arc plus the amount of x arc equals less than or equal to 800 million and then from that total token supply what is kind of the breakdown like i mean some go mm -hmm. to the team some go to the tge event how is that all determined yeah so we have a uh we have uh on our light paper um we have a chart i believe the um the allocation is uh 25 for team uh and advisory so that's two buckets up to that the seed is uh the seed in private and public makes up 25 22 percent um and then we have a uh we have tokens that are kind of like in a vault for uh, platform expansion like if we needed to an example would be if we needed to raise additional capital to expand to a new game we could pull from the vault and uh do like an otc deal with a uh with a venture capital partner to to fund that expansion uh, and then we have nine percent for community incentives which will be like uh the um which will be like the uh lp staking so our we have a, a very similar lp staking mechanism to alluvium where you'll be able to lock your lp for 12 months or whatever and get a a, a uh an emission from that be but nice. yeah we can cut we can cut in the token al allocation or, or edit it in or whatever for people that want to see the full breakdown yeah totally i i expect as i edit this i'll be throwing in the slides just for reference yeah <laughs> um one thing i found really interesting is in that vault you had <laughs> two separate vaults you had your legacy vault and i forget what the name of the other one was but can you talk a little bit about the difference between those two vaults yeah so uh legacy vault and then uh very cleverly mm -hmm. named by i believe chat gpt um was <laughs> uh the other one was the agility vault um <clears throat> and um we love chat gpt so i think some of our stuff was named by that because we're not great at naming things um but the the legacy vault is essentially where the uh the platform fees pool so we wanted to have a 
uh, like a deflationary effect on the amount of tokens since there is tokens being released through, um, you know, other means like the LP staking. We wanted to have some way of creating a deflationary tokenomic, uh, tokenomic mm -hmm. structure. The fees from like, so when you, when you swap back from X arc to arc, mm -hmm. it is at a one to one ratio, but there's a fee of like, it's two percent let's use that as an example you pay like a two percent fee to swap back out and that two percent goes to the legacy vault the legacy vault is essentially very similar to I have to be careful how i word it in public no it's essentially um it, it very much is taking the tokens out of circulation the legacy vault is verifiably locked for 50 years um Ooh. and did you say yeah 50? 50, 50 years 50 years um so people can draw their own conclusions about what effect that has compared to a traditional burn what we can't do and what we won't do because we're a compliant us-based company is uh we can't permanently affect supply but we can uh, we can put tokens into a vault that is locked away. So uh, people can can take what they wish from that, but the legacy vault is where the fees go. Um, it is verifiably locked on chain for 50 years. Um, the agility vault is uh, essentially, the way that that works is, let's say there's 10,000 tokens worth of space on a mission pool. The community fills 80% of that. What Arcade does is we go in and backfill the 20%. Okay, so now we're a contributor with a 20% stake. Mm -hmm. The 20% from that goes to the Agility Vault. So when we get our cut as the Mission Pool contributor that filled the gap, we take that 20%, we put it into a separate vault that can be used. That one is specifically used for like... Um, it can so agility was intended in the way of like it can be used in a lot of different ways but mm -hmm. um it's it, it's like kind of like a i don't know if insurance would be like the best way of putting it but like if if there's a mission pool operator that like flies off the rails and like does something crazy and we feel like people were wronged um we would be able to pull from that agility vault to like compensate people for some kind of crazy circumstance right so it's tokens that are also taken out of circulation um but uh can be used a little bit more at our discretion when we feel like there's a need for it um but yeah that would be the two uh kind of different types of token sinks so you're saying it came from the two percent um fee that happens when you're going from x arc to arc um is it that full two percent that's being split between those two vaults so the two percent from the fee goes to the legacy vault Okay. Um, and then the agility vault is sourced from backfilling the mission pools. So um, it essentially is, you know, community puts in 80%. Arcade backfills the 20% because all missions go, they start at 100. Like mm -hmm. if only 80% fills, it doesn't, then the 80% become 100%. We actually mm -hmm. go back and backfill the 20%. We actually take from our treasury the exarc and put it into the into that mission but then when we get our split as a mission pool contributor we take those rewards from it and put it into the agility vault so we're taking our split from backfilling it and taking those tokens out of circulation that is a really interesting progress like <laughs> that's really sorry i'm i'm not a numbers person but i try really hard to like learn as i'm available and anyone watching mm -hmm. if you're not a numbers person scoreox has a great interview with jp where i think they go into this a little bit more as i said i'll link it below um because i'm not a numbers person we're going to step away to another question i had <laughs> no uh, more in the sense of i just wanted to talk a bit about how um this gives us access to games that are on different chains and i wanted to talk yeah. a little bit about like which which games and which chains are you guys including on the site at the current moment? And which ones do you hope to expand to? Yeah, so um, I think what's what really makes our platform unique is for a lot of people we were talking to, one of the barriers they didn't want to have to deal with, I think we even maybe touched on it um, at the start, was like 
for people that are busy, you don't want to have to juggle a dozen different wallets to get exposure to like all these different games. And like maybe I've even talked to some people that are like, I'll only touch games on like that launch on one chain because like I don't want to have to like bridge funds all over the place and like get exposure to a bunch of different places. Um, so we do a lot of that logistical work behind the scenes for people so mm -hmm. that the mission pools can be supported on any chain. So the DAP itself lives on Avalanche. Um, you'll need, you know, some AVAX for gas on that chain, but you can get exposure, you know, direct exposure to games across all of these other, other chains. Um, so chains we have relationships with. Uh, we have some smaller L2s that are kind of obscure that people haven't even heard of that are, that are building games. Uh, we have... Uh, the scale network which is another kind of obscure one but it's is getting a lot of interest for for gaming uh we have matic we have avalanche we have bsc we have uh elron we have uh even polka dot ecosystem stuff and uh, uh you know kasuma um we have um you know base we have um really it can be anything as long well the the only limiting factor is that it has to have a bridge back to ethereum so mm, that's okay. kind of how the behind the scenes part works but if you think about the first bridge all of these chains build it's pretty much bridge a, a bridge back to ethereum so most of these chains have that already taken care of um for games that we currently have um so some of the big ones would be like heroes of mavia star atlas alluvium um we have some smaller ones that are from uh or like some more niche ones for like um the future verse economy or, or uh, ecosystem if you're familiar if not i think you would actually really in like what they're putting out but um they're actually on the root network which a lot of people haven't heard of but mm -hmm. again that's just another example of like okay do you want to, to to learn a new blockchain or do you just want to get that exposure through arcade on avalanche right and some uh, there's a lot of people that otherwise would never commit capital to something that's on a chain they don't want to have to learn about um but uh we have about a dozen games currently um i i would i would go as far as to say that over the two and a half years that i've been doing this i have had personal conversations or meetings with every game that anyone <laughs> watching this can think of so we probably um, are in talks with your favorite game. If they're not on the platform yet, then it's something that we have coming. Um, but, you know, we have a great relationship with the Gala Games team. Um, Heroes Mavia, Star Atlas, Alluvium, um, uh, Godzilla, uh, Off the Grid, Shrapnel, uh, um, Walker World. Uh, really, the list goes on. And I mean, our, so I know we've got maybe Alluvium Star Atlas, and I saw a new one pop up today on the site called Nectarville. Um, yeah, so so the Nectarville one, so the game is actually called Honeyland. Um, that one's based on Solana, and uh, it's a mobile game. It's actually pretty cool. Um, but uh, yeah, so I mean, that's, that's a Solana-based one. Um, and uh, as we go into our TGE event, we'll have more and more different types coming. Like we have... Uh, we have a mission pool for big time coming. Uh, we have one for Zed Run coming, uh, AI Arena, um, Photo Finish. Uh, it's kind of similar to Zed Run. Um, honestly, the reason that I have a research team is that <laughs> I myself could not possibly keep up with all of the different games that we're in talks yeah. with. <laughs> so I need an entire team of people to do that. But um, we uh, we do have great relationships with builders in the industry for sure. Yeah, I'm not gonna lie. The more I think about it, the more excited. Well, a I just like being able to invest in something at a small amount because I'm I'm mm -hmm. not a high roller. I can't roll out those ten G's to get going on something, but being able to put like twenty bucks there, a hundred dollars there, that's really interesting. And when you couple that with the idea of you guys kind of having an information library and those streamings to be able to like hey i want to see like he keeps winning he has a hundred percent rate you know if you get viper on for example how yeah. does he you know just outperform on pvp arena or what it is yeah. it's great because it's just this whole different level of just exposure to these games before you mm -hmm. decide to go and buy your own because maybe you participate in the pools you learn about it that way and now you're like hey you know i think i want to play this game for myself 100%. and at that point you can go and uh make that decision and yeah. And that's why game developers love us, honestly. <laughs> um, it's because we're free marketing for a lot of them, right? Like 
Yeah. Like you just you just learned about Honeyland right now. Like you didn't know you maybe you didn't know that existed, but you saw it on the platform. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, we're free marketing for them. Um, people get a taste of these in-game economies through the mission pools. They learn about the different genres, how it plays. They can, like you said, watch people play it all in one place and then maybe they decide, "Hey, I want to go buy a plot of Alluvium land," right? Or I want to mm-hmm. go enter the overworld and do it myself because this looks really fun. Right. So um, anyway, a little bit of a tangent, but yeah, I mean, that's why we have great, such great relationships with developers is because we work very cohesively with them. And you know, what? that was actually a, that was all the questions I had for today, but you know, before we wrap this up, was there anything that maybe I didn't ask or we didn't cover that anyone who's thinking about participating in the TGE or checking out the website just like absolutely needs to know? Um, honestly, I think you've done a really great job of, of asking questions. Um, you know, I would just say that, uh, we are, you know, we're, we're early. Um, we have, um, a lot of, uh, really exciting partnerships with games coming down, you know, within the next few months. Um, the other thing that maybe I'll leave as kind of a a hanging fruit is that, um, when you think about the arcade platform, what we've talked about here has mostly been, mission pools and that is the first thing we're doing um but i think what when it really is going to get exciting is that mission pools is just like one product that it's like our flagship product Mm -hmm. but we have like three or four other products for exposure to gaming uh one of which is is a uh esports arcade which is going to be uh like a tournament platform that we're building type of thing um so like when people think about what we're doing um the mission pools is just the start. Like we have so many things in development. We have like two years of, of development, uh, you know, planned out already. So just really excited to be here. Um, anyone that, that participates in the public sale or, or buys our token on the secondary market afterwards, um, you'll be able to have immediate utility with that token. You can go right to our platform with it and, and have fun. And um, any questions, I'm an open book. Well, it sounds like from what you just said, I definitely need to have you back on once some of those <laughs> maybe become a little bit more public, but loving the yeah. alpha that we're dropping here. Um, beyond that, everyone who's watching, thank you so much for joining us today. If you would like, as I said, a more in-depth look into the economy and the tokens, Scoriox did an absolute fab job talking to JP. I'll put that link to the video in the description below, as well as the white paper, the... Uh, Fjord Foundry site and uh, anything else I can think of to really help you get your information going. And until next time, lizards, stay scaly, stay adventurous, and take care.